This is the expedition through Exodus. And I believe we've made it to chapter 6 in the book of Exodus. We're going chapter by chapter now. And in chapter 6, the Lord promises deliverance to Israel, who is under the bondage of Pharaoh and Egypt. And in, e in Exodus 6, 2 through 3, it says, And God spake unto Moses, and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known unto them. Now, when you start doubting God, just remember that you have the same God that appeared to these same Bible characters. The same God that appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses. And he's still around. Isn't that an amazing thing? Are your enemies going to be around that long? Are your false gods going to be around that long? You can literally... If you're a saved person, you literally have 24-7 access to talk to the same God who appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same God who appeared to Adam and Eve. This is the Ancient of Days. The Lord God Almighty. And his name is Jehovah. The rapper Jay-Z blasphemed God by calling himself just that, Jehovah. But there's just one, Jehovah. And it says in verse 6, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God which bringeth you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And I will bring you in unto the land, concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it you for an heritage. I am the Lord. So with all these promises, Moses and the children of Israel shouldn't be afraid to go forward and face anything that comes their way. Moses shouldn't be afraid to go forward and face Pharaoh. The children of Israel shouldn't be afraid to go forward and leave Egypt. He's told them of this 100% certain victory. He's going to give them the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just like he's told us that we are victorious. He said in 1 Corinthians 15 that death will be swallowed up in victory. And 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be unto God, which causeth, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. So we're going to win no matter what. He's promised us certain victory. Just like he promised Moses, 100% victory, if he just does what he says. Chapter 7. Now we're going to start getting into these plagues. And in Exodus 7, 5, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt, and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Pharaoh said, I know not the Lord. Remember? When Moses approached him the first time, he says, I know not the Lord, neither shall I let Israel go. Well, Pharaoh is going to know now, once the Lord releases the plagues on them. It says, the, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And you see, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The lost world does not realize that the Lord could make this world reel to and fro like a drunkard. They don't realize they are, that they're in hot water messing with the Lord because he is a consuming fire. They don't realize the Lord could take the water of this world and drop it on the dry land. And one scoop and, and just kill everybody on it. So that's the God Pharaoh was messing with. It says in verse 6 in chapter 7, And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them. So did they. And Moses was fourscore years old. And Aaron fourscore and three years old when they spake unto Pharaoh. So Moses was 80 years old. Aaron was 83 years old. 
And here they're just getting started for the Lord. You were think they would they were just like twenty or something because of all that's left for them that they're gonna do in the Bible. You see, it's never too late to get started for the Lord. Maybe you've not done much of anything uh, with 70 years of your life. But you might live till you're 90. So that's 20 more years. Give the last 20 years of your life to the Lord. It's never too late. In Exodus 7, 10 through 12, it says, And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent, just like it did for Moses. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But... Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Now this picture is Jesus Christ, who said himself, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You see, when Jesus Christ was on the cross, Jesus Christ became a serpent. And you know what he does? He swallows up the old crooked serpent. He destroys him that hath the power of death, the devil. So what the uh, Aaron's serpent swallowing up their serpents pictures Jesus Christ who became a serpent, our serpent on a pole, and he swallowed up that old crooked serpent. And since the magicians can copy the miracles of Aaron and Moses, Pharaoh won't let the children of Israel go. So this begins the plagues. And these plagues are going to picture... Things that you see in the tribulation time period in the book of Revelation in Matthew 24. It says in Exodus seven nineteen through 20. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Take thy rod and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up his rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. So remember, these plagues are going to picture the plagues that come about in the tribulation time period. Moses and Aaron are being used of God to bring the plagues. In the tribulation, the two witnesses. In Revelation 11, one of them just happens to be Moses they're going to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And of course, what do you have during that time? The water's going to turn to blood. Revelation 16, 4. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. So you got water turned to blood in the tribulation, just like you got water turned to blood back here in the book of Exodus. And the first miracle Jesus did, you know what it was? Turning the water to wine. And wine in the Bible is a type of blood. Moses is a type of the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank. And the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river. And there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Now notice that word stank. Did you know a lot of people like to change that, that word? Why would you change that word? That's a very easy word. I mean, everybody knows what stank means. You still hear people say that that's a very common word i mean even watching the grinch movie grinch movie as a kid what does the song say about the grinch he stink stank stunk or whatever and bible scholars though they don't like the word stank there must be too hard for them to understand or something isn't it weird they people want to change even the parts of the bible that's so just easy common they just have a motive that they want to change the Bible. But the fish also die in the tribulation. And in Revelation 16, 3, it says, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. <coughs> in Exodus seven twenty two, And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. 
isn't this crazy? Why would they want to cause, why would these uh, magicians, why would they want to cause even more water to be turned to blood? I mean, they didn't have any water to drink at this point. They hadn't been turned to blood. So they must have had to go somewhere and get a bottle full of water just to prove anything you can do, I can do better. This shows the devil isn't concerned with absolute truth. He only wants to counterfeit God in an attempt to prove that he is better or at least like the Most High. So the magicians say, oh, you can turn water to blood. That's nothing. We can do stuff like that. We are like Moses and Aaron. We are just as good. We are better. But really, they aren't like Moses and Aaron. You see, to win the duel here... They would have needed to turn the water back to drinking water, not turn wa any uh, drinking water left to blood. You see, it makes sense that God turned the water to blood because, remember, the Egyptians were shedding innocent blood by killing the male babies in the river, so he gives them blood to drink. Now, chapter 8, you got plague number 2, the frogs. In Exodus 8, 6, And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Wouldn't you know it, though? Frogs show up again in the tribulation. In Revelation 16, 13 through 14, it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. You see, those unclean spirits are like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, just hopping out. In the tribulation, you're going to have a uh, world ran by devils, devils covering everything like frogs. And in the plagues here in Egypt, what you got, it, it pictures a world full of devils. In Exodus 8, 7, And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Wow, what smart guys they are. Instead of using power to get rid of the frogs, they just made more of them. You see, that's like how the devil can't be original. The devil can't um, uh, do his own thing. He can only copy what he sees daddy do, the Lord. And he's nowhere near as powerful as the Lord. The devil, way more powerful than us, but he's, he's nothing compared to the Lord. And just like these magicians are nothing, they, ha they got power, a lot more power than we've got. I mean, we can't take something and turn it into a serpent. But they're nowhere near as powerful as Moses and Aaron. So, Exodus 8.8, 8, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord, that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. Isn't it funny? Pharaoh knew where to go to get rid of the frogs. Just like most sinners know where to go to get rid of the wicked stuff. In their life, you see, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't go to the magicians and say, "Get rid of the frogs." They just made more frogs. He has to go to Moses and Aaron. And today, you know, it's the same way. You know, you got the lost world, and you got born again believers. No matter who the, the I mean, the lost world may have more power to do certain things on this world. But when it comes to having power, the born-again believer is the one who has power because we've got God. And that's who you turn to in any situation. He has more power than anybody in this world has. Now, plague number three, you got lice. Exodus 8, 17 through 19. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. 
Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. So, the magicians couldn't do it. The devil can create life. He will bring life to the image of the beast in the tribulation, but he can't bring life from the dust. He cannot uh, copy that original creation where God made man from the dust. Only God can do that. And the magicians admit that this is the finger of God, singular, one, one God, admitting their gods can't do it. Now, remember, the Egyptians are polytheists. That means they believe in more than one God. Deep down, they know there's just one. Just like Pharaoh, deep down, he knows. He can see it with his own two eyes here, but he's too proud. Just like the devil knows. It's a losing battle, most likely. He knows he's lost. He knows he's going to lose. If he's read the Bible. He knows all of it's came to pass, just as it said it would so far. But he's too proud to quit. <coughs> Plague number four, you got the swarms of flies. <coughs> Exodus eight twenty four through 28. And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not meet so to do. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes? And will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you should not go very far away and treat for me. After the flies were gone, Pharaoh still wouldn't let them go. Uh, and it, even when he's going to let them go, what does he say? Don't go far away. Just don't go far away. You see, the devil will let you go to church. But he doesn't want you to go far away. Monday, he wants you back doing the things you've been doing. And that's what most people do. They may go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But when they get back home, they're just doing the same thing they were doing. He doesn't care if you go to church all three times. What's that helping you if you're just doing the same thing that you were doing when you're not there? See, a lot of people, they think that going to church makes you holy. When they're doing living just like a lost person through the week. And uh, if somebody finds out you're a Christian, what's the first thing they ask? They don't ask you what's your favorite book of the Bible, what's your favorite Bible verse. It's where do you go to church? Some of the most wicked people in the world go to church. Uh, you see, the devil's fine with that. He just wants you back with him on Monday. Back with him in the middle part of the day on Sunday. With him all day on Wednesday. You see? Don't go far away. And after the flies are gone, Pharaoh still doesn't let them go. And once again, flies picture unclean spirits. The devil is Beelzebub. You know, you've read about Beelzebub. That's another name for the devil, and that name means Lord of the Flies. So flies picture unclean spirits. Frogs picture unclean spirits. Uh, unclean birds picture unclean spirits. Chapter 9, plague number 5, you got dead cattle. In Exodus 9-6, And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and... All the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. You would think Pharaoh would wake up and smell the coffee. All the Egyptians' cattle are dying, but not Israel's cattle. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. It just made him more mad and more hard-hearted. He's the type to revolt more and more, no matter how much he's whipped. No matter how much God punishes him, it's making him uh, 
meaner and meaner. And then chapter 9, you also got plague number 6, the boils in Exodus 9, 10 through 11. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil, breaking forth with the blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. So it's six to nothing now. Moses and Aaron are stomping Janes and Jambres, the two magicians in this duel here. Magicians versus the men of God, and it's a complete slaughter. It's a landslide. Moses and Aaron are destroying the home team, and the fans are quiet as a mouse. They got boils all over them, and the boils... This will picture the grievous sore that came upon the men that take the mark of the beast in the tribulation time period. You see, in the tribulation time period, you take that mark. Eventually, you're going to get this very grievous sore on you. It talks about this in Revelation chapter 16. Now, plague number seven, you got the hell coming down. In Exodus 9, 23, And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord set thunder and hell, and the fire ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hell upon the land of Egypt. Pharaoh is uh, messing with the God that made the clouds, that made the rain, that made the lightning and the thunder. He's messing with the God whose voice itself sounds like thunder, and the God himself who has lightning around his throne. And fire ran along the ground. The lightning was so bad it was coming down and then going horizontal on the ground too. You see, God is a God of fire. He is a consuming fire, the Bible says. And what's going to happen at the second coming? He's coming back like a lightning in the sky. He's coming down, and then it's going to be fire running along the ground. A fire is going to go all over the ground when... The Lord comes back on a white horse. Exodus 9, 24. So there was hell and fire mingled with the hell, very grievous, such as there was not none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Do you know what's going to be in the tribulation? <clears throat> hell and fire, and it's going to be mingled with blood in Revelation 8 and chapter 7. That which hath been is that which shall be. There's no new thing under the sun. The Bible is not just history in the Old Testament. It's also telling you the future. In Exodus 9, 25 through 26, And the hell smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that were in the field, both man and beast. And the hell smote every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hell. Once again, Israel is taken care of. This should be a sign to Pharaoh. And most likely it is, but he's too proud. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hell and the thunders were seized, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. Just like when you pray for mercy and the pain or turmoil that you were going through subsides, you go right back to doing wicked again. When you do that, you're being like Pharaoh. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Now, chapter 10, you got plague number 8, the locusts. Exodus 10, 13, And Moses stretched forth his hand over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. Imagine waking up to that. This just gets more and more like the tribulation. Because what happens in Revelation chapter 9? Locusts come up out of the bottomless pit. And it's going to be ugly. It says in Exodus 10, 14, And locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there was no such locusts as they, neither after them shall it be such. In the tribulation, what are you going to see? Locusts. And these locusts are different. They're going to have faces like men, hair like women, Stings in their tails, and they're going to torment men for five months. Revelation chapter 9 is where it talks about this. Men are going to desire to die, and death shall flee from them. You don't want to go through that time period. Plague number 9, darkness. Exodus ten twenty one. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, 
that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And the Egyptians and Pharaoh are bloody people, so he gave them blood. They are dark people, so he gives them darkness. Compare this with him turning the Antichrist kingdom to darkness in the tribulation. Revelation 16.10 Exodus 10, 22 through 23. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. This pictures how even though the whole world is in darkness, for example, it says in 1 John 5, 19, and we know that, the, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness, the whole world is in darkness. You can still walk in the light. In 1 John 1, 6 through 7, it says, if we, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanseth us from all sin. And since the spirit of God is in you, in your body, and you have to spend time down here on earth in this body, you got a light in your dwelling. Your dwelling is in your body, and there's a light in it because you got the Holy Spirit in there. Israel had light in their dwellings, even during this time of darkness in Egypt. You got light in your dwelling during your time of during this time of darkness in the world. In Exodus ten twenty four, and Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. So Pharaoh says he's going to let them go, but they have to compromise. They have to let the herds and flocks stay. In another place, he wanted the kids to stay. In another place, he only wants the men to go. And you see, this is all an attempt to make them have something that they need to come back to Egypt for later. You see, the devil wants you to leave something behind so that you will have to come back to the world. He wants you to keep something in the world so your affection will bring you back. And the best thing to do is, if it's righteous, take it with you. If it's evil, then leave it in Egypt, in the world. Now, chapter 11. Moses and Israel find favor with the Egyptians in Exodus 11. Through, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Kind of like how Joseph was always finding favor everywhere he went. He found favor with the Pharaoh back then. Daniel does the same thing. He finds favor wherever he goes. And even though they are godly people in an ungodly world, the Lord can make even your enemies to be at peace with you. That's what he does for Moses. That's what he does for Aaron. But in chapter 12, he brings that last plague. And this is the knockout punch right here. In chapter 12, you got the Passover. What you have in this chapter is one of the greatest pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ anywhere in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul even tells us that Jesus Christ is our Passover. And in John 1, 29, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus is our Passover. He is our Lamb. And in Exodus 12, 3, it says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Now verse 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from, a, from the sheep, or from the goats. Notice at first it said a lamb. At first to you, Jesus Christ was just a lamb. Then uh, you encountered a preacher or a soul winner, and he let you know that Jesus is the lamb. He's the only one you need to be concerned about. And then you got saved and you made him your lamb, as it says in verse 5. So in verse 3 it called, him, called it a lamb. Verse 4 it called it the lamb. Verse 5 it's your lamb. And that's a picture of how you saw Jesus Christ. That's a picture of how I saw Jesus Christ. At first, he was just a lamb. Then I figured out he was the lamb. Then I made him my lamb. <laughs> and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So they had to take the blood of this lamb 
put the blood on the two side posts of the door and the upper door post of the houses. So you got blood on the side post, blood on the upper post, and blood on the other side post. So blood on three posts. This pictures Jesus Christ and the two dying thieves on the crosses. Jesus would be represented by the upper door post because he's magnified above those guys. So it's a great picture. It's a picture of the crucifixion. And that also kind of pictures the cross. On the two side posts, blood on the two side posts, and on the upper posts. And it says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. All the plagues were showing how God is superior to the never-ending false gods of Egypt. They had so many gods because they're polytheists. They have so many gods. It's like a never-ending list of gods that they have that can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they're not able to save them when the Lord swipes through with these plagues. Exodus twelve thirteen, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Just like when you get the blood on your soul. When you believe the gospel, the blood was applied to your soul, and when God dishes out his wrath, he's going to pass over you. Exodus twelve fourteen, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it, a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And then in Exodus 12, 29 through 30, And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, and to the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. He even killed all the firstborn of animals. And Pharaoh rose up in this night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. After this, Pharaoh lets him go. If they did this one first, Pharaoh probably would have let them go a long time ago. But God wanted to bring all those other plagues because God used Pharaoh to show his wrath and to make his power known. It says in Exodus twelve forty eight, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, <clears throat> let all his males be circumcised and let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So to keep the Passover, if you uh, had to be circumcised and become a Jewish proselyte, if you were somebody that was a stranger, not of you know Israel, you had to come be circumcised, become a Jewish proselyte, and you, then you'd be as one born in the land. You would be as one of them. And this pictures how if someone is going to partake in the Lord's Supper that we have, we do today, you know what? they have to do they have to be spiritually circumcised and that happens when you get saved when you're born again you get spiritually circumcised then you're able to partake of the ordinances the lord's supper and get water baptized so see the picture to partake of the passover they had to get physically circumcised to take the lord's supper today what's the requirement be spiritually circumcised but this was the expedition through Exodus, part two, and we'll be in part three next week.